Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is David Kong. Um, I am the last speaker between you and lunch. So this is a tough spot to be in, but I will uh, move as quickly as I can. I'm going to uh, talk fast, not as fast as Pat. That was like one of the fastest talks I've ever seen in my life, but I will, uh, I will try to uh, be fast, but not too fast. Um, as my computer, as we have a biodigital interface here between my computer and the screen, um, I just want to, again, congratulate um, all the organizers, so Patty, the Fluid Interfaces group, and particularly Pat, um, for really having the vision to pull together this, uh, this wonderful community. Again, I think uh, one of the strengths of the Media Lab is our ability to work across different disciplines. And I'm curious, even here in this room, how many of you consider yourselves to be uh, synthetic biologists or identify as synthetic biologists? Fewer than I thought. Okay, how about designers? Oh, lots of designers. Artists? Okay, and how about uh, human-computer interaction folks? Lots of HCI people, very cool. So, I mean, already I think this, is, this in a way is history, bringing together folks from really disparate communities like that into one room uh, for us to hopefully really formulate and think about what this new field could be. So, um, it's such an honor to be here with you all. Uh, this is just a photograph of some of the wonderful students and research that I get to work with. Uh, some of you are in the room today, so thank you all for being here. Um, I really love this prompt of Cultivate. I'll talk a little bit about cultivation and the concept of both tools, interfaces, and communities, the next generation of innovators that will hopefully launch this whole field. So quickly about tools. Um, we heard earlier from Rachel about a project like Mushtari, which has a, a wearables for microbial systems. Um, a project that I led a prior, to, prior to coming to the Media Lab at MIT Lincoln Lab was on 3D printed artificial guts, right? So how could you elaborate, uh, leverage advanced digital fabrication tools and build sophisticated multi-material systems that could capitulate some of the features that we find in real guts. They could have uh, polymeric uh, components that could squeeze and uh, enable peristalsis. Um, and then you could also have different types of gradients built into the structure as well. Um, you can imagine now folding in technologies like what uh, Deepak was describing with organoids, where you could have a system that was built using digital fabrication that's integrating different types of uh, biological materials. Um, again, one of my technical areas of expertise is in microfluidics or lab on a chip based systems. So we've done a variety of work as well trying to re recapitulate and study how you could create these different physiological and biological um, gradients that you find in nature but doing it in chips. Again, to try to um, uh, develop some in vitro models for, for animal testing, for example. One of the projects that we're working on in the group right now is something called Zapor. Um, so Berenice is here in the back. I think Teja is not here, but um, Teja is really the, the innovator and the visionary behind this tool. Um, this is a $10 DNA electroporator. Okay, so electroporation, I think for those of you that may not know, is a foundational tool and a way we can get DNA into a cell. If you want to reprogram an organism, you have to get that DNA in there somehow, and electroporation is one of the ways to do it. Um, Teja was really brilliant in thinking about different types of high voltage sources that are available around the world. One of them is a fly swatter. Less than $10 available almost everywhere on the planet. He figured out how to hack a fly swatter and turn it into a functioning DNA electroporator, and has been figuring out how to workshop this tool and uh, get it into the hands of different communities all around the world. Um, we're also working right now on some very high throughput microbiome technologies using droplet microfluidics as a way to sample, isolate different types of microbial communities, and then systematically study how those strains can interact. Um, we've seen some of the examples already today. If you want to have a, a community of organisms that could live in your gut and perform some type of sensing and actuation and function, um, you have to be able to study and characterize these strains somehow. So we're working on different co-culture technologies to do that. Um, again, a big part of our initiative is all about sharing. How do we ultimately take all of this knowledge and wisdom that we have out there and put it out to many diverse communities around the world? Um, in collaboration with Lincoln Laboratory and also Ron Weiss's group, uh, we developed a, uh, a platform called Me uh, Metafluidics, which is a large-scale um, repository where you can find all of these design files to build uh, artificial teeth and uh, biofilms and all kinds of crazy systems. So you can go check out Metafluidics to look there. Um, I'll shift now and talk a little bit about how to cultivate communities. Uh, again, I'm a community organizer in addition to being a technical synthetic biologist, so I do with social justice work and community organizing. Uh, one framework that I think is really cool and interesting and very Media Lab is this idea of innovation at the edge. What happens when the cost of innovation goes down and so now more and more actors can involve in a field? We see this all the time in information technologies and computation, but what's going to happen with the life sciences, right? Um, and so connected to that idea is why is diversity important? Why is it important to get people from different technical and creative disciplines working in a field? Um, before uh, synthetic biology, um, we had biology as a life science, and the founders of synthetic biology included folks like this. This is Jurendi, a uh, dear friend and uh, mentor, a longtime uh, uh, MIT guy, 
Mariah as well. Um, Kit was talking earlier about um, Tom Knight, who's uh, shown here in the front. Um, and both Tom and Drew were engineers, right? Tom was a computer scientist, Drew was a civil engineer, and both of them asked themselves, why can't I engineer a cell the same way I can engineer a computer or build a, a circuit or uh, the built environment? And so this whole field, in a way, was born by non-biologists. A bunch of non-biologists came in and said, why can't we engineer things uh, just like we do uh, in, in other disciplines? And so now, I think, synthetic biology has been an incredibly successful experiment. There's now multi-billion dollar industry around it. Um, but now I think what's happening, and, and this room is a prime example of that, we're seeing this influx of other creatives into this field, which I think is so critically important. A number of years ago now, I taught a class on uh, microfluidics and synthetic biology. Just as an anecdote, there were two students in this class I'll highlight, Will Patrick and Julie Legault. Some of you may know them. They were former Media Lab students. Uh, both Will and Julie were designers. They had never been in a wet lab before, never pet, uh, picked up a pipetter before uh, taking this class. And now, just a short few years, uh, years later, both of them are CEOs of their own biotech companies, very successful biotech companies. <laughs> so Julie has founded a company called Amino. Many of you may know it. It's a desktop biology lab that does microbial cell culture. Uh, for education and learning purposes. Will Patrick leads one of the hottest uh, startups in Silicon Valley. Like people are, he's like, don't give me more money. I have too much money. People are trying to throw so much money at him. Um, but culture biosciences, incredibly successful. And I think Will's skills as a, as a designer have really helped bring a new level of innovation into engineering uh, fermentation systems, which has been uh, something the field has really needed. So synthetic biology and exploration of how uh, engineering can be mapped to biological systems, uh, something that happened around 10 years after the founding of synthetic biology uh, was a, something called do-it-yourself biology, right? So a bunch of people said, why does synthetic biology have to be just for the fancy academics or the industrialists or the people in government labs? Why can't everyday people start getting involved in synthetic biology? Um, a field that I have been trying to push and crystallize and frame might be something called community bio. It might be something about not just individual actors or individual laboratories, but networks of labs, communities that are actually working together in concert. Um, when I joined the Media Lab in 2017, the first thing we did was we organized the Global Community Bio Summit. Um, in a way, you can think about these community laboratories. They're like maker spaces or uh, computer clubhouses or fab labs, except for the life sciences. This first event that we had in 2017 was like a family reunion with a family you didn't know you had. Uh, folks from all around the world that really cared about bio, coming from totally different cultures, geographic uh, regions, and um, really had a, a really incredible meeting uh, right here on the sixth floor. Um, we had folks like George Church you know, commenting on the historic nature of the 2017 meeting. Since then, we've had uh, two more bio summits in 2018. We nearly doubled in size. Actually, this photograph was taken right here in this room, which is pretty cool. Um, Pat, I think, is still a dinosaur in this photo, as you can see in the front. Um, <laughs> Uh, then uh, last year, just this past fall, we had Biosummit 3.0. Um, we could barely fit everybody into this room now. More than 500 people uh, were accepted to participate. And again, incredible global uh, representation. One of the things about the Biosummit I think that is so, um, so powerful, um, we really have this be a, a really experiential event. We had more than 170 participant-led talks, breakout sessions, and workshops. This is a whole field that's about co-creation. It's about participation, everybody getting involved in science and synthetic biology. And so, as we've been doing this work, there's a whole key research and scholarship aspect to this. So, how do we ultimately structure these global communities, right? Um, one thing that's, uh, for me, has been a new field that I've been getting into but really excited about is this idea of collective intelligence. What does this network look like? How do we ultimately create a system and a global community that can do synthetic biology and biodesign and bioart in a more powerful way? Uh, Tom Malone, who's a close collaborator um, at the Center for Collective Intelligence at Sloan School, has this framework that I really like a lot called superminds, right? You can imagine this room could be a supermind. This whole field of wearable biotechnology and global interfaces could be a supermind. So in the case of community bio, how do we ultimately activate this supermind? So what brings a global community together? It's not a hierarchy. There's no CEO. There's no dictator. You have to have some way to bring communities together. And so there are a couple things that uh, we think are really important. Having a shared sense of values, a shared vision, a shared sense of ethics, all really important. I really appreciated the, uh, um, the talk earlier from the design lab talking about values and how that connects with design. So one thing we did at the second bio summit, we actually did a large scale exercise where we measured the values of our global communities. So you can see a few of them here, self-actualization, pioneers and progress, but these were the the measured values that we found from our global community. Um, we also had a really powerful co-creation exercise where we designed a statement of shared purpose. Why are we all here together? I actually think that might be a really valuable exercise for this group to even think about. Why are we here together? What is our shared purpose, right? So this is something that we did in collaboration with Harvard Kennedy School and Marshall Gans, who's a legendary community organizer. I'm going to read to you the statement of shared purpose. I think it's really cool. I hope you like it too. It goes, our shared purpose is to 
fundamentally transform the life sciences and democratize biotechnology to inspire creativity and improve lives by organizing life science change makers and bioenthusiasts to build an inclusive global network, cultivate an accessible commons of knowledge and resources, launch community labs and projects, and enable local educators. What do you guys think of that statement? Woo! Yes. I loved it too, it's something I was really proud of uh, when we released that, and again, it's co-created, so people could see, oh, we contributed that word, we contributed that phrase. Um, in order to scale this thing, it's a big global movement. One thing that we launched last year was a global community biofellowship program. We identified 36 leaders from all around the world with a strong emphasis in Africa and Latin America. We had them go through a leadership development program. Um, they all came to the Bio Summit right here uh, last in October, and they had a whole bunch of awesome projects. I don't have time to talk about them, but just trust me when I say they're awesome. So uh, I'll skip through these, but they were really, really powerful projects that um, I really appreciated. The other thing we did last year, we did a co-design of a community ethics document. What are our norms? What do we want to think about when we design these technologies? In contrast to computers, right, living systems, they replicate, right? It's, a, it's you know, if you release it out of the wild, there are serious consequences around this. So um, we did a whole co-design of a, of a co-created ethics document, which I think was really wonderful as well. So we had 11 ethical principles that we identified, and, uh, and, and again, you can look at this on the Biosummit website. Um, in closing, I'm wrapping up now. Um, Education and knowledge, getting this, this know-how out to the world, very important. There's a course that I teach called How to Grow Almost Anything with George Church, Joe Jacobson, and others. Um, it's a biotech class across scales. We've taught it as an MIT class. Pat was one of our students last year. I think there are a few students in the class here right now, uh, from biodesign to protein design and so on. Um, so we've taught this as an MIT course, but also critically, we've taught it in a global context to the network of fab labs and also community bio labs that are out there. Um, so that's been a really powerful thing. Um, iGEM, many of you may be aware of, the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, also a really valuable educational institution. Um, I've been involved with iGEM since the start, uh, back uh, when it was founded here at MIT. My most important role probably is that I'm the official iGEM DJ, so uh, my favorite thing to do is to uh, rock parties for nerds. If you have a nerd function, please let me know, I'll DJ it for you. Um, uh, I'm also the official Media Lab DJ, I've been DJing parties here at 99 Fridays for about eight years, so, uh, so let me know if you have a nerd function, that's what I'm here for. Um, um, and finally, uh, my final project I'll talk about is on the interface side, right? So this project, I think, hopefully um, will, will give a sense of what can happen when you bring together artists, designers, technologists, musicians, et cetera. So we ask this question. We're looking at the human microbiome, an incredible area of scientific research, but what does your microbiota sound like? What if we could create a new inter interface that would allow you to uh, look at the microbiome from uh, a musical perspective? So we create something called Biota Beats. Biota Beats is a, record mi a rec microbial record player that translates data about the microbiome into sound and music. So again, I'm a DJ. We like to scratch vinyl, vinyl records. Um, what if you could scratch Biota records, right? Um, notice the, uh, the gloves and the good sterile technique. So what we did was we built this system, a whole bunch of hardware, a bunch of imaging uh, as well. Um, we used a retrofit record player, turned it into an incubator. We had Biota records that you could swab different body parts from, inoculate them inside this, this incubator. Uh, the microbes get imaged. We collect data from them over time and use algorithms to convert that data into music. So here's an example of some of our, bi our biota records. This is Annie Liu, one of our students, uh, sampling her toe bacteria. And then we image the microbes over time, and then we get this cool data, and I'm going to share some music just to wrap up. So, um, okay, so here's some microbial music. So um, maybe we can turn up the sound now. All right, so this is uh, feed bacteria. No more needs to be said here. Uh, the belly button. Armpit bacteria, the oral microbiome, and when you put it all together, uh, it sounds like this. Would you 
you guys think? Very cool? Awesome. So, incredible cross-disciplinary team that's required to make a project like this happen. We thought to ourselves, cool, uh, you've got vinyl records, what if you could sample the bacteria of like really cool artists and make beats out of their bacteria? So again, I'm, I'm a big hip-hop guy, these are photographs, I'd say this is Q-Tip, uh, Questlove, some of my favorite DJs. Anybody know who this is? Yes, yes, so you might know him better from this. I, we're getting old here, so this is DJ Jazzy Jeff. I was at this event with speaking with Jazzy Jeff uh, two years ago, and I set up a little DIY lab in the green room, and I was like, Jeff, I have this project, Biota Beats. Uh, we make music out of microbes. Can I sample some of your bacteria? And uh, Jeff looked at me and was like, you know, this is the weirdest question anybody's ever asked me, um, but yes, you can. So, so this is DJ Jazzy Jeff, uh, you know, sampling some of his oral microbiome. Um, so this is like the favorite picture I've ever taken of all time. Look at how happy DJ Jazzy Jeff is. He's inoculating some of his oral microbiome onto a, a, one of our Biota records. It's also good branding. You see the Media Lab logo like reflected in his sunglasses. Anyway, so, um, so, so Jeff, uh, it was a super great project. Uh, we made beats out of his bacteria, and then we made beats out of iGem. So we went to iGem, we sampled the microbes of about a, hundreds of students in a project called Universe. Um, anyway, so you get the idea. This looks like a, uh, like a coronavirus map, but it's not. Um, this is, this is uh, where we sample uh, the different teams that we uh, sampled the, the, the organisms from. So each continent represented a different uh, musical sound and a different body part. And then, uh, you know, we created this really cool composition. You can look it up on YouTube. I won't play the whole thing because I'm out of time. But um, we had hundreds of students participate this in this project, which again, I think is a really great example of an intersection between art, design, technology, and so on. So um, with that, uh, just thank everyone everybody for all of their time, and again, this, this meeting, um, again, I think what we're doing here hopefully is a historic moment for all of us as a community, so I really hope that we can bring these, these uh, features together and do some really great brainstorming, and I'll leave you with this meme, so thank you all very much. Okay. <laughs>